So they want to train super soldiers who can sense the future before it happens. That could save lives. It's fascinating. I also mm. under, uncovered a whole world of professional intuitives or precogs working under the radar for major companies. I found that. I had no oh. idea. We live in strange times, people say. This is a time of crisis. This is a time of individuality. These times are this, that, or the other. As if we could separate chunks of what we call time from, uh, from, other, from other chunks of what we call time, when we're in fact stuck in a continuous now moment. I mean, where are all those other chunks now? Maybe it's all accessible in the continuum of the now moment. Maybe it's all happening at once. And is it then possible for us not to not only re-experience at will the so-called past, but also to pre-experience the so-called future? Welcome to Mind the Shift. I am Anders Bolling. Today, I am honored and happy to introduce you to Teresa Chung, one of the most positive and open-minded, but also one of the most popular, successful, and uh, also most hardworking researchers and writers of all things spiritual. Welcome, Teresa. Hello. Lovely to be here. Thank you. And I love the fact that you said we live in strange times, that that was introducing my podcast. When you live in strange times, we talk to Teresa Chung. <laughs> <laughs> That's that was exactly what I thought, but it was more of an example of what people t say when they talk about time. Yeah, I, I know. I, I, I get I'm your saying, point. I've never had so much interest in what I write about. As I said, I've written about this for 20, 25 years, yeah. just plugging away. But recently, because the world is in such crisis, I mm -hmm. I, I can't keep up with the the level of interest in subjects which are second nature to me and I've just been writing about, but it's almost like everybody wants to find out about them for the first time. So maybe there is something happening. I, I was thinking of coming back to that later, actually, Sorry. in the interview. But no, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's all it's all good. I mean, time doesn't exist anyway, so we can just as well talk about <laughs> the last things first and vice versa. But you've been doing this, as you say, for, for about 20, 25 years now. You've been yes. writing books and, yeah. And yeah, you were I started... kind of born, in, born into it because you're... Your parents were into the spiritual things as well. As as Absolutely, I, I was more on my mother's side. My father yeah. was more in the environment, uh, you know, a green warrior at, in that, in that time. But um, I was definitely born into it, so it was commonplace for me to be talking about esoteric, mystical matters as a very mm -hmm. young child, um, and it just felt natural to me. And it was almost like our sixth sense is our first sense. And it was only when I went out into the world and I realised that actually. That's not how most people regard intuition, premonitions, dreams, psychic abilities, the afterlife. Yeah. So it was um, a learning curve when I went to, to Cambridge and um, encountered people who had radically different views to my own, but very, very important for me to be well-rounded in my approach and to see both sides, all sides of the picture. Yeah. And I try to That's carry that forward. I, I always try to speak to people. I don't enjoy speaking to people who are already believers. I mm -hmm. did in the beginning, but right now what I'm loving doing is taking this spiritual message, what I write about, to people who are going to laugh or ridicule or contradict. I've been doing that a lot in the last 10 years, and um, I find that the most exciting to, to try and mainstream it because I just think it's super normal abilities are normal. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. I love that. And you have so many things going on. You have so many projects. You you uh, you hold talks as well, and you have you have your own podcast, White Shores. <laughs> and Sorry, I'm laughing because it is very. Yeah. It's just done as a, a little bit of fun between hobby project, maybe, and a few readers. And it's kind of because it's rather eccentric, slightly slightly mad. Um, it's okay. actually very, very popular, and now I'm sort of like stuck with it, and it's getting weirder mm -hmm. and weirder. But um, that's 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 fine. Um, but I do the, do talk. I think that's yeah, that's that's what people love to hear. Uh, anyway, I mean, your books is, is your main, your, your core 
work, I guess, uh, is your writing. And you have written so many books, more books than I can even list here. And several are bestsellers, and they're often very instrumental and and practical, which I think attracts a lot of people. I can just mention a few titles here. The Dream Dictionary, The Astrology Fix, A Hundred Ways to Be Kind, The Sensitive Soul, 21 Rituals to Change Your Life, How to Find Heaven, and How to See Your Angels. I mean, just the titles are so enticing. Oh, so thank we'll hopefully you. Have, yes, we'll hopefully have time to speak about several of these spiritual topics that you've covered, but I would like to dwell a bit on a book that you uh, that came out in 2018, I think, and 17. that you're featuring on your website. 17? The Premonition Code. The end of 2017, yes. It came out at the end, yes. Right. So, And it's also, also part of a training program, is that correct? Oh, yes. A very fierce training program. Mm -hmm. So be afraid, anyone listening, because it's, the, it's looking at precognition, the hardcore yeah. science way, not the fluffy, I see feathers and I have dreams way that I tend to do in my book because I collaborated with a neuroscientist um, yeah. and uh, had tremendous fun doing so. But that training on that website is entirely free. It's part of an international experiment to see if we can detect precognitions, people who are super precogs. Um, it's entirely free, no cost at all. It's done in the spirit of science and learning about our ability to sense the future. Mm. Yes, I, I noticed that. I mean, it's very scientific. I just read the book and it's it's scientifically <laughs> uh, based. And But, uh, but I mean, uh, you, you really span the border between science and spirituality, which is the, the perfect thing, I think, but what I really love. And in the book, you and co-author Julia Mossbridge, who is a neuroscientist, as you mentioned. A neuroscientist. Uh, you, yeah, you, you show that sensing the future is possible, and you also provide practical tools and, and techniques. And like you say in your book, almost everyone has experienced something that at least resembles having premonitions about what's going to happen or what's happening in a location very far from where you are right now. So we can get back to the hands-on knowledge about this, but central to this whole notion about sense, sensing the, the future or the so-called future is, of course, time itself. So I've, I've pondered a bit, I must say, on that subject myself. And, of course, I've read Eckhart Tolle's famous book, The Power of Now, which talks about uh, that there is nothing else than the now moment, actually, and the future, the, the past are just uh, mental constructs. And then a uh, compatriot of yours, uh, this uh, philosopher Alan Watts, said something that really boggled my mind. Uh, and I think he didn't come up with it himself. He, he, I just think he just conveyed old Eastern wisdom about time and about existence. He said that if, we, if you think of us as being on a, on a, on a ship and, and we're going somewhere, then we can just vaguely sense what's on the horizon. But behind the boat, there's a wake. And the now moment is where we are on the boat. But the wake is the past. So, so the past is the wake of the present, which means that that we are not we are not products of the past, which is what we are conditioned to believe. I mean, this is so so the other way around, uh, seeing things so completely the other way around that than than we are used to here in the Western world, and that really boggled my mind. So, what do you think about that? Is it you think we are formed by are are we kind of drawn to the future more than the, than rather than we are products of, of, of the past that we just experienced? Well, in the Prim Code, we talk a lot about being pulled by the future. The our future self pulling us a certain way. I, and I love that idea. Um, Dr. Julia and I, I looked at that and all the research studies, how the future can actually impact your present. And we have this notion of a long body over time where the past, the present and the future, you, there's an awareness of it all, all the time. And the journey of our lives is in the present to make future or shake hands or make friends with your future self, to be compassionate towards that future self. And um, a technique that we're, uh, Julia uh, in her Institute of Love and Time is now recommending is that you leave a recording every day for your tomorrow self. So it's like, and then you listen to it and it's about being compassionate to the person you are to, tomorrow. Now, I know this sounds like, oh, it's against the power of now and living in the present moment. It, it truly isn't because in every instant, like right now in the second that I'm talking, I'm creating, there's ripple effect that's going to be created mm -hmm. by what I'm doing right now. So I'm very respectful when I'm speaking to you of how what I'm saying 
will impact my future, the, pe- the future of the people who are listening. And it's just having this reverence for the future, understanding that we are creating it in the now, mm. that we try to um, encourage people to understand in the premonition code. And if you understand it that way, you see your future self as just a continuation of what you're doing now, make friends with that future self. That's how it's possible to have dreams and premonitions, precognition is the o- umbrella term of the future of a potential future. Now, people often ask to me, well, you know, what do you mean by a potential future? What I mean by potential future, if you have a plate and you drop it, now the future of that plate is going to be smashed, but you can always intervene and catch it. So you are able, the future is written, but it's, you have choice, you can change it. It's, it's, it's not set it. in stone. No, I mean, there's, there's a, you know, the chances are if you drop something, it's going to smash. Yeah. But you have choice. You can catch it if you have the skill and the timing and the choice and the desire to change it. Mm. A lot of people actually, you know, moan about their future or feel depressed. But what they don't have is the desire to change their now, what mm. they're doing now to change their future. Because they don't realize that they have the future in their hands. That they Absolutely. Have the we have, we have, lives. They yeah. think they're just... Uh, as I said, I think products of the, of the past and there's nothing you can do about it. You're a product of your parents, your upbringing, your you environment. Are. And I mean, people tend to get stuck in that. They don't realize that yeah. they can change things. But, you know, you, you can also, you know, travel back with your thoughts and your consciousness to revisit that past and nurture it as well and try and course correct it a bit. Be compassionate to that person you were in the past as well. That's another very powerful meditation technique. Reparent yourself. If you weren't parented properly, if you weren't loved properly, if things went wrong, you can in your present go back and take care of who you were in the past, repair that damage heal it you know it's parenting yourself reconnecting with the person you are and that's another very powerful way i mean basically all that we write about in the prem code is viewing time with love and compassion to yourself and others if you do that life will change dramatically and you're also going to be much more intuitive much more in tune with who you are and what what your future is going to be you're going to have more vivid dreams you know uh, suggesting what your future is going to be yeah, that's fantastic. I I I, I believe it. <laughs> uh, but that's interesting when you talk about the past because, well, the future is not set in stone. But maybe the past is not is also not set in stone. Uh, no. <laughs> did, did, did you have you heard about the so called Mandela effect? It's kind of a crazy thing that people were talking. No, about. No, I haven't. Tell me, please. Well, there were, a few years ago, people were started in the spiritual community. I guess started talking about how some people had different memories of what actually took place in history or in politics yes. or in the world in the 80s or 70s or whatever, than, than, than the majority of the people. So then they were, they were thinking, of maybe we were in different timelines, <laughs> which is really, this is really, you know, far out. But anyway, yes. kind of makes you think that the past is possible, perhaps also possible to, to tamper with a, a bit. Yes. I mean, I, I do think that the future can influence the past as well. This whole idea of a causal loop, what causes what, you know, we try and delve in that in the book as well. And what I love about it is it's just infinitely fascinating. You have to resign yourself to the fact we're not going to know what time is. We're not going to know who we are. And once you resign yourself to that and just open yourself up to whatever insight and knowledge come in, comes in, mm it's so exciting and you suddenly realize that you are this infinite potential with the ability to see the bigger picture of your existence not only your existence but everyone's existence and all these tools and techniques that we give in the book help people do that see the bigger picture of their lives and fine-tune that muscle in their brain which we all have it's a basic human trait. It's in our DNA. We have this sixth sense, this intuition. And we report in the book all the studies around the world which have confirmed that. You know, even the US military is investing in millions in research into spider sense, they call it, spidey sense, you know. So they want to train super soldiers who can sense the future before it happens. That could save lives. It's fascinating. I also mm. under- uncovered a whole world of professional intuitives or precogs working under the radar for major companies. I found that. I had no oh. idea. 
they contacted you when you started? Well, it's through Dr. Julia Mossbridge because she is okay. a, 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 the precognition expert and she's conducted all these experiments and she's also worked for law enforcement. And and we, we formed um, on Telegram a, um, a group called Precog, the Precog Code Group, I think. It's Prem Codex, it's called. And on there are people who work as professional, either remote viewers, intuitives, you know, in the stock market, in law enforcement, in all areas. Hmm. A lot of big companies, you know, you think they're really rational and commercial and material. They're not. And you actually think of it, why some companies are so successful is because underneath it all is gut instinct, intuition, yeah. Yeah. getting it right. I found that really, really interesting yeah. that, the, you know, the commercial but world. They're, yeah, they're, they're working under the radar, so to speak, but they have their, I mean, their they're known that what they're doing is known by their bosses so it's, oh, of course yes actually and it's very easy to find it's just it's not yeah. known generally in the mainstream because just like mm. in science this kind of research into the possibilities of the paranormal if you want to i call it supernormal i i, I don't like that word paranormal because it makes it look woo woo it's supernormal it's it's within all of us there's enough studies and data out there to show that you know we have these abilities we're just for some reason turning our backs to them because they frighten us you know, we're, it's almost like we're frightened of our own potential um, and science as well. It's taken a long time for science to start really investigating it. And that's why I loved working on the premonition code. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a theologian. I study the mystical, the esoteric. Julia Mossbridge, you know, straight A student, massive uh, scientific qualifications, um, really respected in the scientific world. And for the two of us to work together like that and for it to do so well, the book, was just felt like such a big step forward that science is doing this now. And potentially there are going to be other books now with scientists working with mystics or um, people in the esoteric community. And I, I find that really fascinating. We That's need great. to know this research is hidden in academic and medical journals. And one of the reasons it's not known is because scientists, bless them, they are very, very uh, complicated in how they are. It's all you know, all these studies and protocols and, and everything, and the general reader gets bored and and doesn't understand it. So the criterion with a PREM code, because I'm probably like that, I'm not scientific at all, as you've probably gathered from this conversation. <laughs> so it was basically, I can understand it. I'm sure most people can, you know, because I'm one of these people who very sort of creative, intuitive, and when it gets to the science and the logic, I kind of like rebel a bit or get bored so yeah. well, the book is very very i mean hands-on and and straightforward and, and very easy to read and uh, i think everyone can understand it well we could we're moving forward and we're hopefully going to be doing something that is even more accessible because there are my my readers for example who've known me over the years were like did not know what to make of this book because mm -hmm. my other reads tend to be more of your comfort reads they tend to be a collection of true life stories of people who've had afterlife experiences people who've had dreams and they played out in real life people who'd had sudden intuition or insights so i collect these stories of paranormal experiences um, and that's actually what connected me to the scientists because they use my stories as data you know mm -hmm. as as it's data because you know in any other field of research you had that much witness statements it'd be taken seriously yeah. and since the beginning of time we've had thousands and thousands of these kinds of stories often people who who have not been believers or spiritual in any way and then they have an incredible experience and they want to understand how on earth they had a dream that come true or an intuition that they knew yeah, and I, I, collect it. I see myself as a collector yeah. let's talk about what what this is about is it uh Firstly, is there a difference between premonition and precognition? Would you say Pre precognition is more the umbrella term? I mean, it's, okay. there are slight differences. There are slight differences. I mean, you you have a premonition um, in, when you're awake, or a mm. precognition when you're asleep. It, it, there's all these different things. Intuition is more a sensing in the present moment about what is happening right now, whereas precognition and premonition are definitely about the future. But basically, let's just put it all under the umbrella term precognition. That's how scientists, the technical okay. term, is required. Precognition, then, yeah. And the, the, is this happening mainly during? When you, when we are dreaming, or also is it? I think you mentioned that it can also happen when we're awake. When awake is, it, is, is it mainly the dreams that are 
telling us these things? Yes, it is. Um, um, the scientific term for um, sensing the future when you're awake is presentiment. Oh. And that is a study. Studies have been done on that. You know, people were so, shown a series of cards and they had no idea what these cards would be. Some of these cards had very violent images on them. And what they were able to see by, you know, the brain waves and the heart rate and the sweating was that there was, after a while, there it was above chance that people were sensing the horrific images before they came when they would have had no idea because it was very random. It wasn't like, oh, you know, six, you know, friendly images, one, you know, there was no pattern to it. But in, the studies have shown that people were able to sense this physically mm -hmm. through their bodies. It tended to be through um, sweating heart rate, which is very interesting, showing that precognition maybe hits us first through our bodily awareness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the thinking is with um, in our sleep is if it happens when we're awake, you know, it can happen when we're asleep because when you're asleep, you don't actually sleep. Your consciousness is very awake. As you know, in that surreal world of your dreams, you don't, we, you think people think they sleep. They don't. We are, we are constant. We are eternal. We, we are forever. Some people don't remember their dreams, but if you do, you know that you're very well, alive. That's spooky. That's spooky. People who don't remember their dreams. I think that's spooky. That's for a reason. And it's probably because they're not quite ready to go that intimate and that deep. Because mm -hmm. dream work, you're meeting your soul, you're meeting your true self, you're meeting your consciousness, who you truly are in symbolic form. Everything in your dream is expressed often in symbolic form. For example, if you encounter death in a dream, it means change, the end of something, the beginning. It doesn't actually mean you're going to die or someone you love is going to die in the great majority of cases. Um, so you're meeting yourself in your dreams, and that can be quite scary for some people. Mm. Um, for whatever reason. And if people can't recall their dreams, that's because their soul feels right now, maybe waking life is giving them enough learning and growth. But when dreams start becoming very vivid, I get very excited about that because it's like your soul is crying out to be more, for more attention. Yeah, It's saying to you, and sometimes it will send you nightmares to do that, tough love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You need to face something within yourself You need to understand something about yourself better because it's through self-understanding that we learn and grow. We don't learn and grow in our comfort zone. That's why most dreams tend to be quite anxious and fearful or surreal. And it's for a reason. It's, it's like a shock. Come on, think about what, did, what was that stranger that was chasing you last night in your dream? What was that? What is that in your waking life that you're not facing or dealing with? You know, all that. <laughs> Yeah, well, you're talking about dream dreams now already. I was going to ask you about that, so let's let's talk talk about it. I think most people in my age, maybe others also, think of uh, Carl Gustav Jung and Sigmund Freud when they they think about dream interpretation. And I should say here that you are the the, the uncrowned queen of dream interpretation. You've written so many oh, books, thank and you. bestsellers I'm, about. Well, I'm launching about, Olympia Mind Body Spirit Festival this year. That's been yeah. going since the 70s with. The talk about so, dreams. Yeah, these 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 um, psychologists that I was mentioning, the the, the, the historian historic ones, Jung and Freud. Uh, that was a hundred years ago. Is there something still left? I mean, there's what they described. Does that still hold? Would you say? Oh, they they were the ones who really put dream interpretation on the map. I mean, we've had that before, and dreams were more in line with the Prem code that they're predictive. What I love about Jung and Freud is they brought in the psychological, the self-understanding. And I would say 99.9% of our dreams are symbolic and psychological. They are an internal therapist and much cheaper than a real one. If you think the reason you go to <laughs> therapy and counseling is to understand yourself better. The therapist will say, how did that make you feel? What do you think about that? Your dreams are doing that for free every night. You can save a lot of money by interpreting your dreams. <laughs> yeah. They're doing it. You know, we have our nocturnal therapy through our dreams. However, within those dreams, because the dream world is an altered state of consciousness, we're in a different state, there is a tiny percentage of dreams, I like to call them night visions. Where are we when we dream? Where are we? Where are we? I think we are pure soul, we are tr our true self, who okay, we really we're, are. We're, maybe we're in, in some realm uh, on, on, the, on the way towards the, the highest of the highest, where we go when we die, maybe? Or? 
Well, the pure spiritual, you know, the, the part of us that is infinite and eternal. I mean, if you think when you were a child, you were you, right? Your child yes. now has physically has died and you've become adult, but that that essence, that you has gone on. Mm. And it's the, I think when we, in our dreams, it's our essence that we we reunite with. It's like when someone passes, if you believe in the afterlife and spirit, their essence continues outside their body, their consciousness. Mm. I, but that's, that's, my, that's just a personal belief. I mean, I, I often debate with skeptics who but, disagree, that, that's yeah. fine. There are, there are different layers to this because we're dreaming when we have this REM, we have this REM sleep. That's when we're dreaming, I think, mainly. And then we have the deep sleep when we don't, you, you don't, you don't uh, measure any brain waves. Uh, or I mean, some brain waves, but they're very, on a very low. Dreams level. happen then, in maybe all we're we're somewhere else, somewhere even even higher up in the in the spiritual hierarchy, if you might yes, call it that. Yes, could be. And when we are dreaming, because I mean, I think dreams are very confusing, and they're, I mean. You're all kinds of places, and it often looks like here on Earth, but it's not here on Earth. And you sometimes rem- recognize people, but you know that it, it's them, but they don't really look like them. And you can, it's I mean, brilliant, it's, isn't it? I mean, it's brilliant, I'm, and it's it's like I'm watching just... a movie, but it's very confusing sometimes. So I, how can you pinpoint valuable symbols in this? Easily. Well, that's why in lockdown we had so many weird and wonderful dreams because there was a lot of distress and anxiety going around the world and we had the lockdown dream phenomenon which you know i found myself called on as never before by the media to try and help people understand because people were suddenly waking up oh my god what does this mean what does this mean and what you have to do is you have to write it down and you have to look at each symbol in turn and ask questions of that symbol because remember you are dreaming your state of mind and the more weird and wonderful, the better, I, I think, actually. People worry, you know, when, when it's mad or crazy. That's great. That's exciting. That means you're a vital human being and you've got so many thoughts that want to express themselves. I mean, it's not great to have a boring dream, you know. Oh, I got on the train and I sat at my desk in my dream. That's not very <laughs> exciting, is it? So the more weird and wonderful, the better. But also it's a kind of a therapy because when times are difficult, um, you know, we have a lot of emotions we can't express in our waking life. So we get rid of them cathartically in our dreams, our fears and our anxieties. So, you know, if you are, you know, something violent happens in a dream or there's murder or awful things, think of that as a gift because it's your dreaming mind helping you deal with all this negativity mm. in a safe way rather than in your waking life. So think think of it as a gift when you wake up. But it is possible after a while to start recognizing your dream symbols. If you write them down and seeing patterns, the colors that appear, the people, the themes, they will be in common. And then you can start trying to figure out, you become a detective on yourself, mm-hmm. which is wonderful. You start Googling all sorts of strange things, like you're in a country that you've never visited before. So suddenly you go and Google and you find out about that country and you actually realize it's really interesting and yeah. it's kind of relevant to you. Because your dreaming mind is super clever. Nothing's random. For example, if you dream of a celebrity, why that celebrity and not all the other celebrities? If you dream of a country, why that country? If it's it's recurring anyway. Especially if it's recurring, that means your dreaming mind, as I said, is getting very frustrated with you. And it's it's basically sort of saying, You should go to this country. (laughs) No, you've got to learn something about what that From country that yeah. is, represents. Is, represents, yeah. you know, yeah. um, you know, each country has a specific flavor and mm-hmm. culture or Belgium, attitude. Uh, <laughs> what does Belgium represent? <laughs> uh, stop it. That's t- <laughs> has to yeah. be something like Bhutan or Nepal or something very exotic. Not Belgium or you need to integrate Finland. <laughs> integrate. Well, well, Finland can symbolize some things. So I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, something you need to integrate within yourself or learn because as I said once you start studying your dreams what you do is you actually realize you're much more interesting than you think and you actually fall in love with yourself as the, in the process because you because people you know sometimes you know liking or loving themselves is a struggle for a lot of people but 
I say, look at your dreams, the world you create there, the infinite possibilities you're creating. Get interested in those. And I find with the people I work with, the more they fall in love with their dreams or find them interesting, it's a knock-on effect in their waking life. They start realizing they are really, really interesting. And there's so much about them yet to discover. I mean, we think as we get older, we know ourselves. We don't. No, that's when, we, when you start knowing yourself, when you really start knowing yourself. Because you have, I mean, exactly. you have so many physical things in this physical world, so you can you, you can start going in. As Jonathan somewhere. Swift said, no man who is wise wishes to be younger. That's true. Well, true. I wouldn't want to go back. Stuff, but, but I wouldn't want to go back, no. <laughs> uh, but I, I, have, I have this thought about dreaming. I mean, I dream a lot, and I remember my dreams when I wake up, but mostly I remember the dreams that I had just when I woke up. I mean, morning dreams. Which yes. tend to be a little bit, um, you know, confused. They don't feel as important because it's often about me having forgotten something, or it's it's really I'm I'm a bit stressed and it's going round in circles. You know, all this. It's kind of my subconscious self telling me that you should you, you better wake up now. You better wake up now because you, you, <laughs> well, you've got a lot hours. to do. But then when sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night, that's a different story because then you wake up from the dream. The, the dream kind of tells you that. This is important. You should remember this, and that's that's very very different. Then you can feel in your body that this was important. You you, you feel this urge to write it down, as you were mentioning. Well, actually, dreams between you know when if you do wake up from a dream between like two a.m. and five a.m. Yeah. You know, in monasteries or nunneries, that's the call to prayer. That's a sacred yeah. time. And I think okay. if you do wake up, a lot of people get stressed that they're waking up and they worry about that. I said, don't. This is amazing. Write down. Mm -hmm. What your dreaming mind, your dreaming mind has got something really creative to share with you. Yeah. Don't go and have a glass of milk and go back to sleep. No, no, no. Just <laughs> stay up for 10, 15 minutes and write it down. Some of the world's greatest inventions, works of art, novels, music, art yeah. have been have been from night awakenings yeah, of a crazy. sudden eureka. The, the crazy ideas are the ideas that you would never come up with in your in your awake, wake, wake, waking state. Absolutely, yeah. Two between two and a.m. and five a.m. Sacred five. time. Treat it with respect. Okay. If you do wake up, don't stress about it. I say to people, uh, and write down. That this doesn't happen very often to, to me. It happens maybe <laughs> once. I don't know, once every two months or so. But Great novels and works of arts have been created from a dream. I mean, mm -hmm. Frankenstein, Mary Shelley, she dreamt it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so much inventions. Cool. Like the sewing machine and, you know, great, um, you know, physics theories or whatever have been dreamt. Yeah. Is, and you can, yes, you can, no. you, you mentioned, I think that you can practice how to remember your dreams and of course to interpret them also. Yes, you can. With, A lot with, of help, people. with the help of your books, of course, but what about premonitions? <laughs> can you, how can you practice how to become, a, like you say in the book, a positive precog, a person positive who can... Yes. Well, first of all, the first step is dream journaling. You've got to actually not do it as a chore, but do it because you love it. A lot of it is about your attitude to your dreams. If yeah. you if you think your dreams are nonsense and are, you know, a chore to record them, they're not going to reward you. Like anything in life, if you're kind and you pay attention to something, it will reward you. And it's the same with your dreaming mind. If, you're, if your attitude to your dreaming mind is, is like you're illogical, you have nothing to say to me, it won't. So that's the first thing that needs to shift. Then you need to get into the habit of regular dream recall, right? Because a lot of people do struggle with that. And it is just a gentle shift, often changes in your sleeping environment. So your bedroom's calmer, um, setting the intention to dream all these things, respecting the dreams, filling your mind with creative images, revisiting a dream as well, going to sleep from a, you know, and having a dream that you've had a, a while ago on your mind and say, I want to go back in that dream and talk to the characters and find out. So there are there are techniques that you can do. And in time, the more you fall in love with your dream life, the more they will reward you, the richer, the more expansive they will be, and they will offer glimpses into your future. Um, you may well find, as many people who do dream work do, that they have a dream, and then two or three days, late, days later, they're kind of got that deja vu, been here before. Yeah. When that happens, Anders, it's... I want to, I feel like I can fly. <laughs> it's because wow. something surreal has happened that is unexplainable and has suggested something bigger and greater than me. Mm. And I just find it mind-blowingly exciting. 
And I love the fact now that, the, that around the world, people are starting to understand this, mm. are starting to pay attention to this part of ourselves that can't be defined. Part, yeah. Call it the spiritual part aspect of our lives. And uh, I love that. Because when it does happen, when you've had a dream and you, you're two or three days later and you're sitting somewhere, oh my goodness, I've dreamt this. What's going on there? Well, that's, yeah, that's, it's fascinating. I've, I mean, I've had deja vus, as you mentioned here, but I don't think I've ever experienced that something happens that is, I mean, that, that I have dreamt beforehand or so. But the deja vu thing is, uh, you, meant, you write in your book that it, it can be several things, actually. It can be a premonition, but it can be something that has to do with the brain just to, misinterpreting what logical. is happening. Your brain yeah. can be logical when thinking, well, the likelihood of this happening. I mean, we are, we are creatures of routine. So, yeah. you know, dreaming that you're going to go to work the next morning or be on your computer isn't <laughs> really a pre precognition. It's just common sense. That's what you're going to do. It's yeah. when something happens and when you dream of someone and you haven't heard with them, from them for five years and then suddenly a couple of days later they call. That is really fascinating. Yeah, but these are synchronicities. They, they happen to me often, actually. And I... I I, I, I'm always happy when they happen, but I, I don't get, um, I mean, I'm not surprised anymore because I think. You know, what's going not, on there? It show, suggests that there is a bigger picture yeah. um, behind everything. And I, I think once but, you open you know, your mind to that possibility that we can't explain everything, you know, mm -hmm. life isn't all tidy ends. You know, you, there are always going to be questions yeah. Um, I think synchronicity, when that happens, most people, when that happens, they do, even if they're very rational and logical and scientific in their approach, mm. it gives them pause for thought. Yes. They kind all of I want, pause for thought, pause this for thought. This is strange. Yeah, that's, mm. that's true. Mm. Even those, even the skepticals. But this was, we, this was mostly about dreaming. But what about the premonitions that you can train to have when you're awake? You write a lot about that in the book. How can yes, you train that? that? Now that's that's tough. I'm not there yet. I'm going to be honest. I'm not there yet. There are people but I you're, know. You're practicing yourself. I'm yeah. practicing, although sometimes life is it's it takes time and discipline. And the thing yeah. is, everything's a choice in life. You know what you want to yeah. do. And but if you're really dedicated, I mean, the training we offer on the Prem, Premonition Code website is tough. Keep persisting, and you're going to see results over time. Mm. But it takes time, dedication, and patience. So, you know, um, if that's your choice and you want to give your energy to that, go ahead. I try to, but, you know, I'm busy, you know, mm. with life. And sometimes, you know, you have to, to think, well, but it's, I'm here it's, on it's about kind of focusing on something yeah. that you don't know anything about, but you... yes. Yes. You hopefully yes. will have a precognition of what. Well, in the Premonition Code website, the, 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 you draw uh, it or you write it down or something. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you're talking about on the the website or in in life, how well, you how you would train it. Generally, how you how you can do that. Okay. Well, generally, first of all, dreams. Dreams are yeah. a powerful way to talk to us about the future. Start doing some dream work. Start paying attention and respect to your dreams. That's another thing. Second one, pay attention to your body. As I said, the chances are the future often reveals itself. The immediate future will reveal itself through your bodily sensations that you have a mm. sense of something happening through your body. Pay attention to unusual bodily signs. Feelings, of course, having a hunch or a sense that something's going to happen. And people ask me, how can you tell the difference between a precognition and wishful thinking or anxiety or fear? Yeah. There is a difference. A precognition will be very calm and there'll be very few words in your head. When it's wishful thinking or anxiety um, or negativity, it's a lot of chatter and a lot mm. of convincing that you need to do in your head. So that's one way. Also, precognition will always be nurturing and positive for, the, for your own well-being. It will say, not this way, perhaps it will be better another way. Whereas Anxiety will be, you're a loser, you can't do this, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. If you hear the talk in your head being foul and derogatory to you or others, it's nothing to do with precognition, it's all to do with, with anxiety. And then the third way to tell the difference is when you have a precognition, you do something. You stop living in your head, you take action fairly swiftly because you have this calm certainty. I had this myself once in my life when I was at a, a junction 
And I just knew I had to turn a different direction to the way I was going. I don't know why it was irrational because I missed an appointment. I, there was a horrific accident, accident the other way. I had no idea that would happen. I truly believe I would have been caught up in it with, because it was one of these ricochet ac accidents because I was trailing the car that was involved in it. And I had this sort of sense, no, don't go that way. And I had no idea why, but I didn't question it. I didn't chatter. I just went the other way. Hmm. And that's often a sign of a true flash of intuition yeah. or premonition you do something because I think in spirituality there's so much focus on thinking and and visualizing and thoughts and intentions not mm. enough on action and what you do I'm a mm. fierce advocate these days of positive the power of positive doing rather than positive thinking yeah. I think if the universe is looking at us as someone they want to send good things to I think it's like when you meet someone in life and they're all talk and no action, you get fed up after a while. And I think the universe, after a while, all these meditators and visualizers say, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> are you actually going to do something positive with your life or not? So I advocate the power of ritual, repeatedly doing something positive, even if it's Excellent. something simple like making your bed first thing in the morning yeah. or, or smiling more. You are then a person of action. Mm. Um, so more really? positive doing as well. And Wonderful. precognition encourages you to do, not think. Yes, not the, think. Talking, speaking about this ability to change uh, your future to, to, towards uh, something better maybe than where you're heading right now, uh, what comes to mind is this, of course, this very talked about concept in the spiritual community and elsewhere also perhaps of the law of attraction but maybe oh, yeah. that's something different i don't know maybe it's uh, because that's about uh, how you can manifest what what uh, will unfold in your life in your own life but you can't of course change the courses of everyone else's life around you and precognition uh, encompasses i suppose uh, the whole surrounding while this law of attraction is only about your own life path is is do you well, do I that make sense The law of attraction, again, falls in like books like The Secret and on, on yes. all that, you know, the power of positive thinking. Mm, Esther Hicks and Jerry. Yes, I, Hicks. I'm actually, I don't, I, I've actually tried to be an antidote to that. I think I've met too many people because their thoughts aren't pure or positive enough. They think they're a disappointment. And that's why life is treating them badly. As I say, mm. one of the reasons life is treating them badly is because what they're doing, not what they're thinking. We all know that if you feel depressed and you go for a run, you often feel a bit better because of the physical action of running has mm. changed what's happening in your brain. I think there's too much emphasis on the mind influencing the body, not enough on the body influencing the mind. And that's where precognition comes in. Because as I say, you have to pay attention to your body. You also, it's about loving this moment in time and who you are in the future. Because I believe the law of attraction operates that If you love and respect and are kind to yourself, you are going to attract that into your life. People treat you how you treat yourself, not how you treat them. Yeah. I've seen too many people who are really kind and whatever and to other people, but not kind to themselves. And they and wonder... That shows that, that yeah, you can feel that energy. And they wonder why bad things are happening to them. And it's because the law of attraction, if you do say it works it's working because you attract how you treat yourself mm. start respecting being kind being compassionate to yourself that's yeah. how you attract good things not um the way you treat others often yes. wisely put but i i think maybe the law of attraction the thing around it it's uh, or the principle of that is perhaps uh true as well but it's been misinterpreted and it's and dangerous though so, isn't it you know because it, it makes you If yeah. you if you think it, it will happen. If you think it enough, it will happen. And it's become a yeah. huge commercial industry. People making yeah. loads of money, promising, yeah. you yeah. know. And it it sounds so, so you know. If um, I think, therefore I am. It's based on that. It, it there yeah. is some some um, merit to it because if you don't believe in something, it's less likely to happen. I agree. But let's not forget the important other part of the puzzle, which is what are you doing with your one precious life? What are you yes, actually yes. doing? <laughs> Yes. Stop reading, stop thinking, stop meditating. That's, you know, come on, that's true. do. That's true. <laughs> and there was also a very popular film made from from that uh, the law of attraction. The, oh, the secret, the book. The was it was it a book first and then a film? Yeah. 
I think it's about, I mean, it's a huge um, industry. Maybe it was and, Jerry and, uh, and Esther Hicks's book, and then it was a film called The Secret, and it was very, very big. But anyway, I was just, I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, this is a segue over to, to, to a small little subject, which we hopefully have some time to talk about, namely that you are also a film buff, which I love. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you said that in, in interviews. And I mean, it's surprising how many, Hollywood blockbusters that are actually very spiritual. And I mean, of course, when we talk about precognition, you have the Minority Report, which you mentioned in the, in the book. Oh, yes. I, I'm, uh, but, and about time, you have Groundhog Day, Groundhog Day and Sliding Doors and all kinds of movies. And that, Spirituality, Star Wars, The Force. Oh, yes. Star Wars, of course. Uh, the Sixth because, Sense, Ghost Phenomenon. And of course, The Matrix, which is so much. Oh, mentioned. The Matrix. Yes. Oh, my goodness. But I love the fact, you know, that people in their millions will watch this. Yeah. And what they don't realize is they're getting a spiritual message often. That's, I There's know, a reason I mean, for these yeah. timeless, timeless movies strike a chord. People are not queuing up for the actors or special effects because you know, that, that film John Carter was, you know, you know there are lots of movies are bombed with a mm. huge budget and great actors. But if there's not, it's that underlying spiritual eternal message. That's what draws people in. And I, I, I love celebrating I so that. And, yeah. you know, you can... You have, of course, Christopher Nolan's films. He's, I think he's a Brit. Uh, he's... Of uh, course. Inception, of course. <laughs> Inception <laughs> and Tenet. Tenet is about time. Inception is about dreaming. I, no, I, I do. What I love about Tenet. It's like a, a dream. You have no idea what it's about, but I loved it. I actually yeah. loved it. I, <laughs> it is. I, it is like a dream, actually. I, yeah, you're right. I had no idea what was going on there. Um, Inception, yeah. of course, is. I've watched it. Inception was a big turning point for me, actually, because I realized up until then I'd focused on dream decoding, whereas mm. Inception really triggered my interest in lucid dreaming. That's the ability yeah. to know you're dreaming when you're dreaming, and I can do that now. I'm training myself to do that, and that is, oh, that's the ultimate high. Oh, how is that? Is it like taking a, a, a psychedelic drug or something? Have you ever had it? Have you, <laughs> have you ever had I, it? I don't, I don't think you so. Know? I... I uh... Maybe, maybe slightly, but not, not, not that I can recall, no. Well, just imagine you're in a dream and say suddenly you're like picking up something and you realize you have seven fingers on one hand. You said that I've trained myself to know now, especially with my hands, when they're weird, like they grow fur or they grow longer, that I am dreaming. Uh -huh. And then okay. knowing That's I'm dreaming. I, behind her eyes, that was really released just recently. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yes, absolutely. But that was a kind of a dark. I know, know yeah, uh, yeah. I a don't cult. know why they have to be dark. It's not a cult. Time. It's wonderful because then you can actually yeah. just really explore your potential, and you can role play, you can train, practice skills, learn instruments in your dreams. You can literally do anything. The power of it's it's incredible. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Okay, Teresa, we don't have very much time left, so I will just have to soon wrap this up. But finally, I would like to talk a little bit about, well, we could talk an hour about this, of course, but we won't. <laughs> this podcast, you know, circles a lot around the idea that there is a shift going on in the world. Yes. And uh, maybe there is only the now moment, but different parts of space-time seem to have certain properties anyway. And, and for one thing, humankind is now integrating, beginning to integrate for the first time in recorded history. And this does things to us, arguably. Do you think that humanity is at a, at a crucial point right now, awakening perhaps? Or something. There's a lot of debate to and fro about this. I certainly believe that humanity has been at this point for the last at least 10 or so years. I have seen it. We had it around 2012. There was a big movement of this was going to be a change. Actually, we also had it around 2000 with the you know the new you new, you, new, um, you know century we were entering. But the pa it's almost like you know if there is anything positive coming out of the pandemic, it's made us all focus much more on the meaning of our lives, what truly matters. Um, people are rethinking their lives in radical ways because they've been forced to. We've all forced to become a bit more contemplative. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's a shift. Mm -hmm. I, the world will not be the same after this hit. Definitely not. Taken. And I think I can see in the level of interest I'm getting from companies, brands, media, reader messages, publisher interest, there's a huge appetite now for spiritual awakening, life beyond the material. And mm -hmm. for me, 
that is a shift. But it's almost like going back to how we were when when we first began, I believe. When, we, you know, back in the beginning of humankind, we would have been born with this instinctive spiritual mm. insight. Maybe it's full circle now. Could be. It could be. But I think it's hugely exciting. It and I, I love the fact that people are dreaming so much. Long yeah. may yeah. it continue because the dreams are helping you create a happier and healthier yes. waking life. Your latest book is called The Truth About Angels, and it's about what you call the language of the afterlife. What What is your next project, your next big project? Well, The Truth About Angels was actually really a summing up of my um, thoughts on people who've had afterlife experiences or people who claim that they can see angels or visions. It's quite a controversial read um, because I'm not totally buying into all of it. So it's it's actually where I am now. I bring a healthy dose of much needed skepticism because I'm also, I believe in the power of doubt to mm. question these experiences. And if you are going to follow a psychic medium or guru to look at their credentials, what training they have. So it's a book that actually I hope packs a punch and isn't a comfort read as always and gets people to ask questions of themselves and if they are following um, a spiritual guru or having an afterlife experience what what to think about my next project i'm really delving into the world of dreams much much deeper i have an exciting book coming out next year um, where i'm going to because people were writing to me saying well how do i recall my dreams how do i wake up in them I'm going to be doing a 21-step program, very mm -hmm. simple, based on science, for people to do each day to see if it helps them have more vivid, memorable dreams that can empower them in their waking life. So I'm working on that. Also working with companies, doing talks. Um, interestingly, a lot of companies have asked me to come into their, well, zoomed in to their staff to explain the meaning of their dreams. How? Oh. How, how incredible. You talk about a shift. This yes, that's, never that is a shift. I mean, imagine ago. that in the 60s or 70s wouldn't happen. No. I mean, companies like Anthropo big companies, Anthropology, the Hearst Group, they've invited me in to talk to their staff, and they are really engaged. I, I, I feel... That's great. It would never so, have happened five yeah. years ago. No, not even five years ago, maybe. Where can listeners, listeners and viewers enter your universe, Teresa? <laughs> at your peril. Do it at your peril. At your peril. No, it's very hard. Is that, is that the name of your website? <laughs> at your peril .com? No, it's just www.teresachung.com. But if you want to see me in action, I'm doing a talk about dreams on the 24th of May for Olympia Mind, Body, Spirit Festival. It's online. And a tree will be planted for every ticket sold. Um, and so I hope that that's a, a wonderful experience. But I do lots of talks uh, all throughout the year and um, constantly writing books as well. It is an addiction. Mm. Thank you so much, <laughs> Teresa Chung, for being a guest on Mind the Shift. Oh, thank you. <laughs>